Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this the second installment of Exploring Race, Place, and Identity Through Low Country Collections. On behalf of the Decorative Arts Trust and Drayton Hall Preservation Trust, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's virtual program. I'm Carter C. Hudgens, the President and CEO of Drayton Hall Preservation Trust, and I want to offer my deepest appreciation to all of you in attendance and especially our generous sponsors, including Handsome Properties, Gilchrist Bizzle Wealth Management of Raymond James, the Jonathan L. Fairbanks Lecture Fund of the Decorative Arts Trust, and Mrs. Roger P. Hanahan. Your collective support has brought us all together during these unprecedented times. Moreover, your participation and enthusiasm have enabled both Drayton Hall and the Decorative Arts Trust to not only survive, but further our mission during one of the most difficult years in modern history. We're not out of the woods yet, but I thank you for your continued support and hope you'll consider participating in one or more of our upcoming programs. Carrie, if you could please advance to the next slide. Right, so two decorative arts programs that are coming up, a trust tour, Erica Loam in the Concord Museum on December the 1st, 2020, and then inclusive narratives at historic house museums. Please register for these at decorativeartstrust.org. Next slide. On the Drayton Hall front, we have several virtual programs coming up. Uh, beginning in December, the first three weekends, we will be offering candlelight tours of Drayton Hall with battery operated candles. December 2nd, we'll be examining the phosphate mining and postbellum industrialization in the Low Country. December 10th, we'll look at transfer patterns that are existing in the uh, archaeological collection of Drayton Hall. December 12th, our virtual spirituals concerts, the concert that's been taking place at Drayton Hall for over 40 years. We'll do it again this year virtually. And then December the 17th, historic entertaining and wine tasting. Register for these, please visit DraytonHall.org. Now, before turning the virtual podium over to our distinguished speakers, I'd like to pay tribute to the life and legacy of Ed Chapel, who we lost earlier this summer. Many of you have been inspired and influenced by Ed as a friend, as a colleague, as a scholar, as a teacher, and in fact, several of our speakers tonight and from last night have been directly shaped by Ed's expertise, innovation, and humor. Ed's contributions to the field of architectural history, archaeology, and decorative arts are immense. And it's heartbreaking to know that we can no longer pick up the phone, reach out to Ed to discuss the latest preservation project or discovery. Comforting, however, is knowing that Ed's legacy and influences will live on through the contributions of those he worked alongside. From Trish Smith, who we heard from last night, to Lauren Northrup, who will, will feature this evening. Heck, myself, Matt Thurlow, and many of you with us tonight. Ed touched so many people, and his character, devotion, and wisdom will persist for generations to come. Moving forward with tonight's program, I'd like to welcome Tiffany Moman to the podium. She, Tiffany is a scholar, a Mellon Fellow, and visiting assistant professor of Southern Studies at Swanee, the University of the South. Momin earned a PhD in public history from Middle Tennessee State University, where she held positions with the Center for Historic Preservation. As a public historian, Momin's work focuses on exploring African-American placemaking throughout the Southeast, documenting cemeteries, churches, schools, and lodges. Her most recent scholarship centers the experiences of enslaved and free African-American craftspeople through the Digital Humanities Project, the Black Craftspeople Digital Archive, which is available at blackcraftspeople.org. Without further ado, Tiffany, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you, Carter. I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right. Thank you, Carter, for that introduction. And good evening, everyone. And thank you to both uh, the Drayton Hall Preservation Trust and the Decorative Arts Trust for having me this evening. Um, I want to begin uh, with a story that a few of you may have heard me 
tell before. In late May of 1750, John Williams, formerly known as Quash, walked from his home near the Naval Office um, in Charleston, South Carolina, to the office of the South Carolina Gazette at the corner of Trad and King Streets. Williams's visit to the office of the South Carolina Gazette was to place an ad in the newspaper for his carpentry and joinery services. Of his services, Williams wrote, John Williams, carpenter and joiner, living near the Naval Office in Charlestown, gives notice that he is ready and willing to undertake all manner of carpenters and joiners work or any buildings that shall be thought proper to, proper to be offered to him. And as he is a free man, he promises that whosoever shall please to employ him shall find not only their work well done and handsomely finished, but with great fidelity, justice, and dispatch. All persons favors in employing him will with the greatest gratitude be acknowledged by their most humble servant, John Williams. While John Williams was busy at the South Carolina Gazette office, Charles, a carpenter enslaved by uh, Charles Pinckney, and one of the men John Williams supervised on the construction of the Pinckney Mansion, left the site of the Pinckney Mansion and went to work at Pinckney's store on the south end of East Bay Street. Like John and Charles, Pompey also left the Pinckney Mansion and headed to the harbor and boarded a boat where he would work for the next three days. Much like the two previously discussed craftspeople, others would walk the streets of Charleston as well. For example, in August of 1771, Joe, an enslaved jeweler, self-emancipated from John Paul Grimke. In July of 1777, Joe, a sailmaker, self-emancipated from the ship General Moultrie at Rose's Wharf. In July 1780, Jack, an enslaved calker, self-emancipated from John Russell's home at Beaton's Alley. Likewise, Waterford, a tailor enslaved by John Ward at number 17 Broad Street, self-emancipated self sometime before February 7, 1781. This is an example of where this project first began. We started by putting craftspeople on a map out of curiosity. We wanted to connect these black craftspeople to place because place besides primary sources was often the only tangible thing left to document their stories. What quickly emerged were the spatial geographies of black craftspeople in Charleston and across the low country. The previous accounts of black craftspeople are just a few of the thousands of accounts that tell the stories of the enslaved and free black craftspeople who literally built Charleston during its epic rise to prominence in the 18th century. Their stories and others form the foundation of the Black Craftspeople Digital Archive, a digital humanities site dedicated to documenting the lives and experiences of Black craftspeople from the beginnings of this country through 1900. So now, here's a formal introduction to the website that you can find at blackcraftspeople.org. The website is currently home to the records connected to the lives of 399 Black craftspeople, both men and women, both free and enslaved, involved in 25 trades, from wheelwrights and tanners to cabinet makers and goldsmiths, who lived and labored in the 18th century South Carolina low country. We launched the beta or in testing version of the website on August 31st, 2020. Our phase two website will make its debut in February 2021. Working together as a team, we consulted with digital humanists, GIS developers, archivists, and website designers to complete what you see here. We just received our first grant to expand this work into the state of Tennessee, but when we began, we were a fully self-funded project with no support from any larger organization or educational institution. Because of this, we had to be creative, turning to open source software such as WordPress and Omeka and calling in favors from as many people as we could. We knew that we were on the right path and we inspired others to join us on this journey. 
A click over to the archives page will bring you here where you have the option to browse by collection organized by trade, use the search engine to find Black craftspeople by keyword, or even to contribute your own research or knowledge on Black craftspeople fully attributed to you or your institution. The second component of the BCDA is a digital map placing craftspeople on the landscape of the South Carolina Low Country. A click over to the maps page will bring you here where you have the ability to search the data in a variety of ways. You can search through the trade count section by clicking on the bar graphs of a specific trade. You can click on the blue arrow to the left of the screen and search through the set of drop down menus. You can skip both of those options and search by pie chart, whatever works best for you. Clicking a specific trade on the pie chart like I've done here here with the shoemakers will show you individuals involved in that specific trade only. Each different way you search will cause the craftspeople listed in the far right column to change. Here I've highlighted bricklayers on the, on the pie chart, so bricklayers are populated in that column. You can see that the light gray dots on the map represent the bricklayers. If one, were to, if one were to click one of the dots, you would then get this information box on London, an enslaved bricklayer who self-emancipated from Thomas Farr's plantation in St. Mark's Parish, Sumter County, South Carolina. Included in this box, if you scroll down, is a link that will take you to London's profile in the archive, thus connecting the primary source and possibly possible only documentation of London's life to place. Before we move on, I do want to show you what the map looks like for an urban area such as Charleston. So right now we are looking at Charleston and you can see landmarks such as Waterfront Park and well-known streets such as Broad and King Street. But I am most interested in this little blue dot in the yellow square on Meeting Street. Clicking that blue dot brings us to the story of Joe, the enslaved jeweler held in bondage by John Paul Grimke uh, mentioned just moments ago. Here, we've connected Joe to the location of Grimke's home and shop in 1771. Now, admittedly, that is a very, very brief introduction to the website, and I encourage each, each of you to visit the website after today's lectures. But now I want to take a moment and talk about the why. Why the Black Crafts People Digital Archive? First, the BCDA exists because of my research into the previously discussed John Williams and his work on the Pinckney Mansion. Second, I wanted a resource to use that moved beyond traditional archival collections of craftspeople and just the endless collection and cataloging of names. I wanted to better visualize the data. I wanted to ask more questions, interpret the data, and I wanted to see Black craftspeople. And I found that the best way for me to see them was through place. I wanted to facilitate discussions on movement, hence the creation of the map. I found that there was just so much more to the story. And it became a situation for me where I was like in the words of the late Congressman John Lewis, if not us, then who, if not now, then when. And we're only beginning in this work. Our beta site is live, but there is so much more to come and I'm excited about it. This is truly my life's work. And as you can see, taking this chance has really paid off for me. Instagram is the way that we communicate with the public. And we started off slow with me asking my friends and family to follow us and support. We're now up to 18.7 thousand followers and we share these stories four days a week. So continuing on the thought of why we do this work and why it is necessary, I would like to build on the point that there is still more work to do. Some archives, museums, and historic sites have been historically complicit in the erasure of Black craftspeople from the narrative through a variety of techniques, the most common of which is just choosing to ignore them. We've all been on problematic museum tours, and I can remember being on a tour in my home state of Tennessee in 2015 of a slave dwelling pictured here on screen, and the architectural historian giving that tour saying, there is no way enslaved carpenters built that slave dwelling because it was overbuilt. It was just built too well. Well, I had to stop him and I had to let him know that the primary source documentation, my ragged copy of Slavery in the Clover Bottoms uh, presented here on screen said otherwise. 
going forward, our work needs to combat that way of thinking and teaching. We've come far, but not far enough. It's not enough to just be a good museum or a good archive anymore. And you know, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois told, told the public in 1902 in his text, The Negro Artisan, that we were missing the larger story behind black craftsmanship. And it certainly is a shame that some archives, museums, and historic sites still miss the larger story. And you know what else? This slave dwelling and this book written by John McCline, who grew up enslaved as a child on this plantation and wrote his memoirs, provides all the information we need to know about the craftspeople behind the construction of this dwelling and of many other buildings on the property. Mr. McCline, who lived his life and witnessed the happenings on that plantation, left us an entire list. I've included just a few of those names here. When that architectural historian made the claim that these enslaved individuals could not have been involved in the construction of this slave dwelling, he erased them. He refused to acknowledge them and their forced labor. He refused to recognize their contributions because he was too ignorant to see them. And this is the why. When the BCDA receives comments such as these declaring that the work that we do is a slippery slope or that we cannot recognize the contributions of enslaved craftspeople because no enslaver wrote down exactly what their property did on a specific day or because an enslaved person did not sign an object. This is why we do the work that we do because we understand the context of black life and we understand the, 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 the range of black experiences in this country. We will not be complicit in their erasure because their presence disrupts previous scholarship. We will not go along with the status quo and we do not believe in doing things simply because that's how they've always been done. And most importantly, we will not place the burden of proof on people held in bondage and enslaved against their will. They have done enough. So now I hope it's obvious while I named this presentation fighting for recognition because black crafts people were fighting back then and it's up to us as historians, curators, scholars and enthusiasts to continue that fight today. And while in that fight, a few left their names along the way. On the screen is a pot made by David Drake, an enslaved potter held in bondage in Edgefield, South Carolina. We're lucky to know that Mr. Drake made these pots because he signed his name on them along with a host of verses. Two of these examples come from Bellamy Mansion in Wilmington, North Carolina. The top picture is of a brick and the name written into that brick is that of Charlie Fremont, a young black boy laboring as a brick mayor and bricklayer during the construction of the mansion. Mr. Fremont wrote his name into the side of this brick. Next is that of William Gould, and you can see Mr. Gould, you can see his photograph here. He was an enslaved plasterer at Bellamy who wrote his initials on the backs and the edges of the plaster, never to be seen, and only found over 100 years later during renovations. Seeing their signatures and their, and their initials is powerful. These men never thought that anyone would see the top of a plaster design or the backside of a brick, yet they inscribed them anyway. And that action in itself is so significant. In addition to signatures, we know the work of Black craftspeople because they left their presence along every time they left behind their unique fingerprints and inventions in bricks. And this is how we can tell their story. I do want to share a few of my favorite uh, stories discovered so far in this work. A few weeks ago, a colleague of mine asked if I'd ever come across a story involving a free black crafts person helping an enslaved person self-emancipate. I was thrilled that I could tell him yes. By 1830, Louisville, Kentucky was home to a sizable free black community, which represented nearly one fifth of the black population of Louisville by 1860. One member of that community was Dudley C. Jones, a free man of color born in 1805. In 1853, police arrested Jones on the charge of aiding an enslaved woman named Mary 
and her escape from the person who claimed ownership of her body and labor, J.G. Matthews. When Mary escaped, she was hidden in the home of Georgina Stevenson, a free woman of color, and disguised as a boy when she was captured shortly before her relocation to Jones's home. While there is evidence that police arrested Jones, there is no evidence that he was sentenced for the crime of aiding Mary. By 1858, Jones had returned to life as a cabinet maker. On screen is the 1850 U.S. Census featuring an entry for Jones, the newspaper advertisement discussing his arrest, a city directory listing the address of his shop, and a Sandborn map indicating the location of his shop in what is now downtown Louisville. These are the stories that we hope to inspire researchers to tell. I'm lucky enough to have friends involved in museum work across the country, and every so often they will contact me and tell me about an object connected to a Black craftsperson. For example, Annabeth Hayes, decorative arts curator at the Tennessee State Museum reached out to me about a wheel lathe belonging to a wheelwright, blacksmith, and woodworker, William Parkey. Parkey lived in the Rebel Hollow community of Hancock County, Tennessee. Our conversation continued and Annabeth mentioned that the Museum of Appalachia in Clinton, Tennessee had several objects belonging to the family, including an entire blacksmith shop. I quickly asked her to hold on, give me a second, please. While I looked for images from my last visit to the Museum of Appalachia many years earlier, and lo and behold, I just so happened to have images of the blacksmith shop when this project was not even the tiniest of, of, of anything that I anticipated in my future. This story begins with patriarch Newton Parkey, who was enslaved by Joseph Parkey. Newton's son, William, followed in his father's footsteps, and likewise, William's son, Steve, also continued in the family business, and it is his blacksmith shop that is now being preserved by the Museum of Appalachia. What a great Tennessee story. When we at the BCDA think about recognition, one of the questions that we are frequently asked involves recognizing black women. Researchers are interested to know about them and to know what crafts they were skilled in beyond needlework and sewing. I too asked myself those same questions and the team and I worked and continue working to find more black women to include in the archive. The majority of the black women in our archive labored as needleworkers, knitters, or seamstresses. On screen are runaway slave advertisements related to two black women. Isabella, a needleworker on the left, and Charlotte, a seamstress on the right. Both women self-emancipated with their young children. In looking for enslaved or free Black women involved in crafts beyond needlework and sewing, we happened to find a newspaper advertisement advertising the sale of women accustomed to work in a brickyard. Just this week, my colleague Victoria Hensley found records of Black women in Tennessee working as brickmakers after emancipation. I am positive that as we increase our database, we will find stories, more stories such as these. So what's next for the BCDA? Number one is growth. So when we wrap up our beta testing phase, we will be adding more craftspeople to the digital archive and the map. We are dedicated to providing the groundwork for scholars to do more research. In fact, we recently learned that our project, even in this very, 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 very early stage, is being used in a graduate course at Warren Wilson College in Swannanoa, North Carolina, and in an undergraduate course at Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We want to be able to reach more audiences, facilitate more discussions, and encourage students students and others who are involved in this type of work. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we received our first grant for our Tennessee expansion, and we look forward to expanding into more regions and expanding our time frame as we move forward. We want to increase our, crowd, our crowdsourcing and increase contributions from the public. This work does not exist in isolation. We do not want to work alone. We want to hear from as many people and institutions as possible. 
We also want to actively participate in more community events and increase our community engagement. We understand that in order to tell these stories, that we must go to the places they happened and interact with descended communities. We are limited by what we can do due to the pandemic, but we hope to support and contribute to the understanding of Black craftspeople and their contributions. We were lucky just a few weeks ago to attend a Tennessee State Historic Marker Dedication Service for Wil William Edmondson, a noted stonemason. We got to hear local officials and the like speak, but most importantly, we got to hear Edmondson's great niece, Mary Copeland, speak about her great uncle. She shared her memories with us and she shared her stories. And I'm here to tell you that that moment was priceless. We used the time at that sacred ground of William Edmondson studio and home site to la launch our sign campaign. Our intention is to visit as many sites as we, as we can to connect Black craftspeople and their stories to place, highlighting the emphasis that this project places on place and geography. We also want to encourage archives, museums, historic sites, and scholars to ask you questions of the sources and to look for silences in your collections. Look where we got by simply asking you questions about the Pinky Mansion. One of the things that stands out to me the most about this project is that when I began researching the Pinckney Mansion and the life of John Quash Williams, previously written secondary sources only talked about Williams. They never talked uh, about the other craftspeople that worked at the site, and I've highlighted some of their names for you here on screen. And we'd like to, con to encourage sites in that work, and we'd like to hear from you if you are interested in highlighting the Black craftspeople in your collections. I cannot close out today without highlighting my wonderful team. They are the reason that I am able to be here with you today, and I cannot say enough wonderful things about them and, um, and, and just the way that they support me throughout all of this has been so tremendous. I, I can't even put it into words. And before I turn the floor over to the wonderful speakers up next, I want to mention one more time that the BCDA is so much more than a collection of names. We are a liberatory archive as defined by archivist Michelle Caswell and scholar Jarrett Drake. We believe in belonging, building community and the future. And our archive operates on five principles to recognize and celebrate the contributions of Black craftspeople to the founding and building of this country, to educate the public and facilitate conversations on the lives and experiences of Black craftspeople, to connect Black craftspeople to place and the power of place, to build community with the public and with contemporary Black craftspeople, and to actively believe in our work and its ability to impact the future. And I want to leave you with a few final thoughts. In the words of historian David Blight, history is people and every day history matters. And I want each of you to examine your collections and determine what is myth versus what is reality. Every time a curator says, Robert Walker made this desk, they are pre perpetuating a myth that erases the fact that enslaved craftspeople worked in his shop and contributed to the creation of some of those works. And as you re-examine your collections, it is also time to face the past. Some of our greatest museum founders and benefactors stood in the way of progress. They stood in the way of telling inclusive stories and they didn't purchase the objects that many sites need to tell these stories. And it's time to admit that. It's time to be honest about that. But it is also time to look at who you are today and ask yourself, whose recognition are you, your institution, or your collection standing in the way of? Whose erasure are you complicit in? Thank you. Tiffany, thanks so much for a wonderful and stimulating pre uh, presentation and also for your dedication to bringing 
these voices and their significant contributions to the forefront. I know that I will be on the website later tonight. So hopefully we can continue working together in the future. Before introducing our next speaker, I know there may be questions that are brewing. And if y'all can enter those into either the, the question and answer or the chat tabs that should be present at the bottom of your screen, look forward to furthering the conversation towards the end of, of this evening. Now gonna introduce Lauren Northrup, who's gonna be presenting her presentation, Resistance and Resilience, Rethinking the House Museums of Historic Charleston. Lauren currently serves as the Director of Engagement at Classic, Classical American Homes Preservation Trust, the Richard H. Generet Foundation. Previously, she was the Director of Museums for Historic Charleston Foundation. She has a BA in English and Art History from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a master's in literature and art history from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Northrop served as the manager of the Nathaniel Russell House Museum from 2012 to 2014, the collections manager of Historic Charleston from 2014 to 2016, and accepted her current position of director of museums in 2016, which I think, Lauren, that's uh, dated. Your current position is fresh and new at Classical American Homes Preservation Trust. Um, prior to her work at Historic Charleston, she served as curator of collections at the Hermitage Museum in Virginia, the Fife Folk Museum in Ceres, Scotland, and the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. She worked in her in the valuations department, rather at Bonham's Auctioneers in Edinburgh, Scotland, while doing her graduate work in the Decorative Arts program at the University of St. Andrews. She's a proud alum of the Addingham Trust Summer School, 2010, the Addingham Trust Study Program uh, that focused on New York and the Hudson River Valley in 2012 and Monticello's Historic Landscape Institute in 2014. Lauren, congratulations on your new job. I am just happy that you're here, still here in Charleston for most of the year. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Lauren, welcome. Thanks, Carter. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation. All right, are we squared away? Um, yes, I am the brand new Director of Engagement for Classical American Homes Preservation Trust. Um, and I was asked actually to speak in this symposium uh, before that transition was made. So tonight's lecture will really focus on the work I did at HCF. Um, so let's consider this my fond farewell to Historic Charleston. And um, my successor is in the audience tonight, Graham Long. Um, so everyone welcome him to HCF and also say a silent prayer for him as he wades through my files. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, founded in 1947, Historic Charleston Foundation is a preservation advocacy organization who also owns and operates two of Charleston's most iconic historic house museums, the Nathaniel Russell House, constructed circa 1808, and the Aiken Rhett House, constructed circa 1820. My job at HCF was to oversee every aspect of the preservation, administration, and interpretation of these architectural treasures, a job that was at times the joy and the despair, uh, but ultimately the education of my life. Until 2017, my office was located in the hyphen portion of the Russell House, a rectangular addition constructed in 1840 to connect the main house to the first period kitchen house and stable block. For those of you who are unacquainted with the Nathaniel Russell House, it is widely considered one of America's most important neoclassical townhouses, replete with a three-story free-flying cantilevered staircase and an exceptional collection of fine and decorative art. Open to the public since 1955, the Russell House has been through several generations of study and restoration, but it is impossible to fully understand this or any other antebellum historic house in the Low Country without recognizing that Charleston was built on the backs of enslaved men, women, and children. Every brick, every lime wash, 
every Palladian window, all of it paid for with human lives in an environment deliberately designed to reinforce a brutal establishment. The beautiful houses of Charleston celebrated by the whitewashed tourism industrial complex in 2020 were not safe places for enslaved people. They were not homes, they were prisons, beautifully executed, highly ornamented, but intentionally designed prisons. My generation is not the first to realize this and not the first to interpret slavery at historic house museums. The work done in the late 1970s and 80s across the South was groundbreaking. However, due to a lack of documentary evidence combined with intense visitor backlash, I would argue that those efforts languished, particularly in South Carolina. Interpreting slavery became a box to check. It was a separate special interest tour. It was past time to re-examine our methods and redouble our efforts to understand and interpret slavery at our historic sites. In the spring of 2017, I was typing away at my computer on the second floor of the Nathaniel Russell Kitchen House when I noticed something that would change the course of our interpretation of slavery in astonishing ways. Constructed circa 1808, the kitchen house was originally comprised of a cook room, a laundry, and a tight stair leading to three upstairs sleeping chambers. My office was formerly the east chamber on the second floor. As I looked up from my work, I noticed the afternoon light playing across the surface of this door to my office. I stared at it for a few minutes and suddenly it dawned on me. The wood on this door was hand planed. Was it possible this door had survived from the first period? I had always mindlessly accepted the collective wisdom about the kitchen house. I had been told that a savage 20th century gut job had robbed it of any architectural merit and was often told that it was not worth interpreting. My first instinct was to immediately pick up the phone and dial paint analyst, Dr. Susan Buck. Susan, I said, have you ever done paint analysis in the Russell kitchen house? She had not, nor had it been a consideration when she studied every inch of the main house in the 1990s. She was intrigued and agreed to help me investigate further. Hi, Susan, I know you're there right now. <laughs> when Susan arrived, scalpel in hand, I held my breath as she gave the door a once over. You have to remember, I was convinced that it was not possible that this door survived from the first period. So imagine my delight when Susan turned around to me and said, quite simply, this door is definitely original. Susan carried on around the room and quickly established that the door casing as well as the window casing, sills and sashes were first period as well. The evidence quickly proved that we were dealing with much more original fabric than I ever anticipated finding. She suggested returning with an architectural historian to help her read the space and take more samples. I laughed and said, if only you knew one. For those of you unacquainted with Susan Buck, she just so happened to be married to the legendary Ed Chapel. Ed was not just an architectural historian, he was the architectural historian. Ed had retired a few years ago as the director of the Department of Architectural and Archaeological Research at Colonial Williamsburg. I laughed and said he would do fine. Ed's interest in this project was a true turning point. His wealth of knowledge, generosity of spirit, and utterly delightful sense of humor was the bedrock of our team from 2017 onwards. To say he will be missed is a vast understatement. With the combined expertise of Ed, Susan, and Charleston-based historic contractor, David Hoffman, we elected to remove exploratory sections of the 20th century plasterboard Peering through the openings with flashlights, we quickly surmised that original plaster walls survived in every room of the kitchen house, perfectly encapsulated by plasterboard installed in early 20th century. My only role in the proceedings at this point was to stand back and dramatically shout, tear it out. And that is exactly what David and his team did, carefully, of course. As the wallboard came down, the room transformed. And within hours, we retreated to an expanse of original wall with lime washes miraculously intact. The only thing missing was the original chair rail. On a whim, we removed a patch of what David deduced was a modern raised wooden floor. 
Underneath, perfectly preserved, was the wide plank first period floorboards with their last coat of 19th century whitewash intact. With so much of the original fabric uncovered, we were able to get our first sense of the space as it was during the period of enslavement. This living space was probably the only place in the house where the occupants had a moment of peace, if any. It began to feel like a sacred place, to say the least. As we rounded the corner and continued to remove drywall on the west wall, we were disappointed to find that the original plaster was long gone. Our disappointment turned to elation, however, when we discovered tons of debris packed between the studs and the baseboards. We were thrilled to deduce that the jumbled mass of debris was the remains of several undisturbed 19th century rat's nests. Now, before you're disgusted, remember that finding a rat's nest is a thrilling development for historians. Some of us in the group may have jumped for joy. You see, rats tend to gather items from a 50 foot radius, pack them tightly, and then urinate all over them. Turns out rat urine acts as a preservative, which turns their nests into perfectly preserved time capsules. For a group of people whose daily lives are missing from the written record, like those people enslaved at the Russell House, a find like this is utterly invaluable. Working with intern Katie Martin, shown here, we carefully removed the nests from the walls and got to work sorting. We spent several days painstakingly combing through debris and removing artifacts. We found buttons, stockings, marbles, straight pins, crab shells, scraps of newspaper, textile remnants, all manner of fruit and plant material, and hundreds of bones from butchered animals pinched from the cook room below. The most immediately exciting finds were two small fragments of paper. One was a minuscule bit of newspaper with the name Crookshank on it. And owing to the odd spelling, my colleague quickly matched it with the digitized original dated November 1838, jackpot. The newspaper fragment helped us determine the nest was from an 1830s context, which was crucial given our next find, a tiny fragment of paper with letters printed in neat rows we were shocked to discover it was a small piece of a 19th century school book or reading primer. This find was of immediate interest because under the 1830s South Carolina slave code, it was illegal for enslaved people to read or write. This small fragment combined with the huge amount of other reading materials we found in the walls clearly show that someone who lived in the kitchen house was literate. And what's more, they were possibly teaching others. Whether or not the Russell family condoned this illegal practice is lost to history, but knowing it took place and holding the proof of that potential resistance in your hand is exhilarating. The reading primer was the first of a handful of objects recovered from the kitchen house that demonstrate clearly the fact that while you can enslave a person's body, you cannot enslave their mind. Our next find was the result of the Susan Buck method of carefully combing through the rat's nest, then doing it again, then doing it a third or fourth time. On my last pass late on a Friday afternoon, I found this minuscule coral bead. Coral is often associated with children's necklaces and teething rattles in the 18th and 19th century as it was thought to have protective or medicinal properties. Perhaps this stray bead slipped from the pocket of Lydia Middleton, the enslaved nurse who cared for Nathaniel Russell's grandchildren from 1857 to 1865. Lydia is the only enslaved person we have a photograph of from the Russell house. In this evocative amber type from 1857, Lydia holds one of her charges, Charlotte, on her lap and gazes directly at the camera. Despite being described as, quote, a beloved and devoted nurse, by the white family who owned her, Lydia left the house immediately after emancipation and never returned. At this point in our study of the kitchen house, it became evident that we needed to totally remove the remaining 20th century materials in order to assess what remained of the first period structure in order to plan for restoration. As the project expanded, our team grew to include Joby Hill of the Saving Slave Houses Project. As a licensed architect and expert on buildings associated with enslavement, Joby consulted on interpretive decisions and helped guide the project when we needed it most. 
we raised $90,000 in a month long social media based Kickstarter campaign. And David Hoffman's crew began carefully deconstructing the kitchen house a few months later. This new phase of deconstruction, of course, produced yet more artifacts. A large cache of debris discovered in a cavity above the kitchen firebox on the first floor was packed with paper fragments. Dating to the 1850s and 60s, this cache included the fragment pictured here, a page ripped from a Quaker periodical entitled Friends Intelligencer, published in Philadelphia in 1868. In the years immediately following the Civil War, South Carolina's Governor Alston and his family owned the Russell House. Nine formerly enslaved men, women, and children lived in the kitchen and stable quarters working for a small wage. Presumably, one of those nine people brought this Quaker pamphlet home to the kitchen house for further study. While Charleston's Quaker meeting was essentially defunct by 1868, a handful of Quaker women traveled from Philadelphia after the Civil War in order to educate and care for newly freed people during Charleston's reconstruction. Perhaps one of those women distributed this pamphlet. In 1867, Elizabeth Alston wrote that, quote, all but one, of the enslaved people who were freed in 1865 stayed on living and working at the house. Now it is not explicitly stated, but the implication here is that the Alstons in her mind were benevolent slaveholders and those nine people stayed out of loyalty. The Quaker pamphlet is interesting because it challenges that white narrative and makes us think that perhaps someone in the kitchen house wanted to leave, but didn't have the means or the incentive to make it happen. Further exploration in the West sleeping chamber turned up an object that we are still puzzling over. I present it today in hopes that someone in the audience might have expertise or experience with objects of this type. The object pictured here, a chandelier crystal, is perhaps the most exciting and enigmatic object that we've discovered yet. We think it may be a West African spiritual object hidden for nearly 200 years inside the wall of the upstairs living quarters. Wedged tightly between the end of an original floorboard and the first period masonry wall, one end of the crystal identifies it as a Western object, professionally cut for use on a chandelier or girandole. The other end, however, the top part, shows evidence of a percussive strike, which means it was intentionally struck one or more times to shape it into a crude point. Naturally occurring quartz crystals are frequently uncovered at plantation sites, such as James Madison's Montpelier, and are typically associated with West African spiritual practice. Like this one, they are often found near windows and doors. We think perhaps a person living here, familiar with this practice, but enslaved in an urban environment, may have adapted this Western object for spiritual use. We carefully documented the location of the crystal before removing it for study, but our ultimate aim is to return it to its original location during the restoration process. Our next discovery was literally under our feet and initially so caked with grime that we walked past it without realizing for several days. This bedraggled object formerly sandwiched between the first period floor and a modern floor is in fact a two foot by three foot fragment of the only 19th century floor cloth ever discovered in Charleston. The story of its survival, like everything else in this project, is a miraculous one. The original floorboards in front of the downstairs laundry hearth were so worn from at least 100 years of laundry fires that, evidently, a patch was in order. The worn spot was first covered with a section of embossed tin, and that patch was then covered with the fragment of floor cloth, perhaps as padding. Once we recognized what it was, Susan carried out an initial cleaning and the pattern emerged in eye-popping detail. This exceptionally worn remnant of what was once a grand and high style object likely began its life in the main house, perhaps in the entry or stair hall, and as it became increasingly worn was cut down and recycled in the dependency. When the modern raised floor of the laundry was installed sometime around 1908, the carpenters nailed the new floor down directly on top of the floor cloth fragment unwittingly preserving an important piece of Charleston's material culture. Initial analysis by Kirsten Moffat at Colonial Williamsburg revealed that we are actually looking at two floor cloths pressed together. The bottom floor cloth, possibly the older of the two, is visible through large holes and losses in the top. 
Kirsten's analysis suggests the earlier cloth is painted with a deeply colored orange red ground with a design outlined in carbon based black paint. The top floor cloth consists of a coarse hemp or jute backing followed by a deep brick red colored preparatory layer. This is followed by two layers of yellow paint and a design layer that includes zinc based white pigment. Now the presence of zinc is how we can date the top floor cloth to circa 1845 or later. If you've been following the floor cloth story for any length of time, you'll be delighted to know that we have an update. Conservator Amelia Jensen was able to clean the bottom floor cloth and reveal its exceptional early 19th century Greek key pattern. And this pattern is nearly perfect match to the Greek key wallpaper border discovered in the best bedchamber in the main house. In the months before COVID, the team pulled up the floorboards in front of the hearths on the second floor to find two new cavities packed with 19th century artifacts. From those upstairs cavities, Susan Buck recovered this small fragment of rag-based 19th century wallpaper in a brilliant deep blue, which she later deduced was synthetic ultramarine. Perhaps this scrap is part of the answer to a long unsettled question about the main house why one of Russell's daughters refers to the back parlor as the blue room in a letter from 1828. Another striking blue find is this tiny, and I mean tiny, sinuous scrap of what appears to be silk mosquito netting. In my wildest dreams, I hope that it is indigo dyed. Uh, but here is the scrap on the left to the naked eye, and then here it is under Susan Buck's microscope. Mosquito nets, or pavilions as they were called in the period, were ubiquitous in early Charleston and were almost always dyed a striking color. Pavilions were changed seasonally and used throughout the hot months because it was perfectly impossible to sleep without one. Um, and here's an image of a pavilion from 1760. And it's a little bit scandalous. <laughs> Uh, so despite the fact that nearly every Charlestonian of means had one in the 19th century, not a single one survives until now. Amazing. So we hope to carry out dye analysis to determine the source of that brilliant blue and ultimately to fabricate a reproduction of this incredible object. How this textile made its way from the main house to the kitchen house is anybody's guess, but it's another fascinating piece in the puzzle of what daily life was like at this house in the 19th century. Other recent notable finds include a bone comb, a delicate brush made of animal hair, a spool of silk thread, a bobbin for making lace, a small ticking pillow stuffed with sheep's wool, perhaps for a beloved doll, and a brass ring with twill tape intact. You can even under the microscope see a tiny hand done stitch. And this was likely from a bed or a window hanging. The upstairs hearth cavities also contain an inordinate amount of seeds, plant matter, and butchered animal bones. With advanced scientific analysis, these leftovers snatched by rats from the cook room tell a mostly complete story of the food history of the kitchen house. The history of foodways in Charleston is an American story steeped in pain, ingenuity, and resilience. The thousands of visitors who flock to Charleston each year visit predominantly for our city's rich food offerings. The dishes that our visitors seek, shrimp and grits, biscuits, fried okra and rice in its many forms, have their origins in cook rooms just like the one at the Russell House. It is imperative that we understand the food history of our site, given the overwhelming evidence, and also that the role of enslaved cooks be brought to the forefront in the history of American food. In order to better understand the foodways at the Russell House, we've partnered with Dr. Chantel White in the archaeobotany department at the University of Pennsylvania. Using a technique pioneered at Bartram's Garden in Philadelphia, Dr. White and her team will spend the next few years combing back through the bags and bags of material from the kitchen house in order to scientifically reconstruct what was grown, prepared, and eaten at our site over time. This is a first for the food history of the South and we are excited to receive the results and share them with our visitors. Recently, we added a new member to our team, Charleston-based chef and foodway scholar, Kevin Mitchell. Kevin's master's thesis entitled, From Black Hands to White Mouths, 
Charleston's freed and enslaved cooks and their influence on the food of the South is our guiding text in this next interpretive phase. The final component of the Kitchen House project that has proved to be the utmost education is the field work component. When we began this project, I was not familiar with the process of field work, its place in a project of this nature, or the importance of understanding how a building evolved over time. Well, a few years in, and you can consider me absolutely converted. There are still remarkable survivors to be found, including this kitchen house on Prince Street in Georgetown. Cut nails, sash sawn lumber, and multiple layers of unpigmented lime wash tells us that this relatively unaltered kitchen and laundry building was constructed right around 1810, making it one of the best extant comparisons for the Russell kitchen house. It's a miracle this structure survived the 20th century without so much as a fresh coat of paint. The only major alteration was the removal of the porch roof and the addition of a garage door. Do you realize that the dependency structures of Charleston have never been surveyed or documented in any sort of comprehensive way? In a city famous for its preservation ethic and early adoption of historic districts, hundreds upon hundreds of structures devoted to housing enslaved people are being demolished, gutted, and repurposed on nearly every street in the city. Ed nicknamed Charleston's kitchen houses the white rhinos of the low country, and I could not agree more. As money becomes available, we deploy in teams to document these structures before they are gone, but with the current gold rush in Charleston development, we are losing these faster than we can document them. As the Russell Kitchen House project shows, careful study of just one of these structures reveals an immense amount of information about the daily lives of enslaved people, information that otherwise would be completely lost. The stories uncovered in the Russell Kitchen House are important because they illustrate how enslaved people lived rich and complex lives despite their circumstances. The objects extracted from the walls tell stories of personal agency, resilience, and transcendence. It is a redemptive story, a story that helps us identify and empathize with an oppressed people who are otherwise missing from the written record. My final project at HCF is one I will carry with me always. The summer of 2020 was one for the history books, as we all know. The Black Lives Matter demonstrations, the toppling of Confederate monuments, the sudden rush to educate the masses about slavery and racial injustice, all of it made the work we were already doing feel particularly relevant and especially urgent. Pre-COVID and pre-Black Lives Matter, I was working with local artist Fletcher Williams to develop a site-specific installation of his work at the Aiken Rett House. As a descendant of enslaved people and a Charleston native, Fletcher's exhibit entitled Promised Land was a meditation on picket fences and the American dream. Works on paper, sculpture, and hundreds of anonymous pickets represented the nameless enslaved people who were imprisoned and enslaved at the Aiken Rett and houses like it across the South. Fletcher's work celebrates and uplifts Gullah artistic traditions while condemning the white supremacy that controls black bodies in Charleston to this day. As soon as lockdown orders were lifted, we got to work installing his exhibits so that we might give locals a reason to visit when the museum reopened. Seven days before we were scheduled to reopen, George Floyd was murdered and the unrest reached a boiling point. The fury over systemic injustice that was at the root of Fletcher's exhibit crackled through the city. Riots ensued and as Fletcher installed his work at the Aiken Rett, people were sweeping up the glass from broken storefronts just a few blocks away. We reopened the museum cautiously and only for half days through the weekend. Despite that, our visitation was triple what it was at the same time last year. We expanded our hours and thanks to a donor added free admission days to make Fletcher's work accessible to all. Our audience this summer was the most diverse engaged and excited that I have ever seen or could have ever hoped to see at our historic houses. Museums and historic sites have a place in these movements if leadership will elevate and give their platform over to black artists and their unique voices. Now is the time. In 
In years past, I was told that telling a full, fuller story about slavery at our site would alienate our visitors. The truth is, and this was pointed out to me by not only none other than Tiffany Moman, who you just heard from, we have been alienating visitors since we opened our doors in 1955. African Americans have always felt alienated by our sites. And in Charleston, that's a majority of the population. As we look ahead to an aging visitor demographic, it makes sense to reassess our sites and ensure they are engaging and accessible for our local communities. This past year, our Kitchen House Project and the Fletcher Williams exhibit received coverage in the New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, the Magazine Antiques, and BBC World Service, among many others. In years past, I was told that focusing on slavery at our sites would alienate our donors. Well, in 2018, we raised $90,000 for this project in one month. 90% of donations came from new donors. When we applied for grants for the fieldwork portion of this project, we found ourselves in the happy position of re receiving twice the amount of money we needed. Our trustees and major donors are on board, excited by the positive press and impressed by the public's response. I managed the HCF Instagram account for the past nine years. When I left, we had 84,000 followers. Last year, our posts, the majority of which focused on this project and the wider history of slavery in Charleston, reached 12.3 million people. These are the stories our visitors want to hear. We are contributing to a national dialogue and proving that museums are vital to our culture and our collective memory. We are making ourselves relevant to a new generation without abandoning our mission. And what's more, we are uncovering incredible examples of Charleston's diverse material culture along the way. Thank you. Lauren, thank you. That, that quite a powerful presentation there. And these are the stories, as you mentioned, not only that the public wants to hear, but they need to hear. And it's part of our, I think, ethical responsibility as museum practitioners to bring that to the forefront. So thank you. We look forward to following you at the Classic American Homes Preservation Trust. And we also look forward to following Graham at Historic Charleston as he moves your work forward. And I do have to say that I love seeing these pictures of Ed and Susan, and I can only hear the conversations playing out um, as this, this work took, took place. So many, many thanks. Um, we're gonna move on now to hear from Brenda Tindall. Um, and Brenda's presentation is entitled African Roots, African Routes, Interpretations of Race, Place, and Identity at the International African American Museum here in Charleston. Brenda, by way of introduction, is an award-winning educator, scholar, and museum practitioner. Prior to joining the International African American Museum here in Charleston, Brenda was the Director of Education at the Detroit Historical Society, where she oversaw the kindergarten to 16, K to 16 education initiatives, public programming, and provided organizational leadership in the areas of museum visitor experience and strategic engagement. In 2003, Brenda launched her career in the museum field at the Levine Museum of the New South in Charlotte, North Carolina, where she was part of the curatorial team that developed an exhibit that received the National Medal for Museum Service in 2005. In 2015, Brenda became Levine's first woman and African-American to serve as staff historian and Senior Vice President of Research and Collections. Brenda is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including a 2011 Institute of Museum and Library Service at Princeton University. More recently, Tendall is the recipient of the 2020 Museum Leadership Award, one of the highest honors given to mid-career museum professionals for innovation, service, and leadership by the Southeastern Museum Conference. Brenda, congratulations on those accolades, and we look forward to hearing you this evening. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Carter, for that very uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, again, my name is Brenda Tyndall. I am the Director of Education and Engagement at the International African American Museum, slated to open here in Charleston in 2022. Uh, before I begin my presentation uh, proper, I want to extend uh, my deepest gratitude to uh, Drayton Hall Preservation Trust and the Decorative Trust, uh, excuse me, the Decorative Arts Trust uh, for organizing this deeply uh, important and timely symposium uh, to explore race, place, and identity through Low Country Collections. Uh, again, as Carter uh, uh, suggested in his commentary, uh, in alignment with the theme, uh, my presentation uh, is entitled African Roots, African Routes, Race, Place, and Identity at the International African American Museum. I am going to share my screen. Just a second. So that you can actually see my presentation. There we are. Can you see my screen? We can, yes, thank you. Excellent. You know, um, in, in many ways, this topic is um, as um, personal uh, as it is relevant to my vocation as a, as a public historian, as an educator, and as a museum practitioner. And, um, and so I want to begin uh, with a, a personal um, story. Some of you probably are very familiar with this iconic uh, image. Um, and uh, some of you uh, may be familiar uh, with uh, the name Isabel Bumfrey, an itinerant uh, preacher, formerly enslaved woman um, in New York who quickly became a, uh, a voice of the women's suffrage movement. I was introduced to her as Isabel Bumfrey um, but most of us know her by her more public name of Sojourner Truth. Well, I share uh, this image um, because it's directly tied to the ways in which I personally was introduced to African American history and culture uh, within my own academic uh, trajectory uh, and experience. I'm sort of sad to say that really my, the, the first time that I actually was introduced in any formal capacity to my own history and culture was in the 10th grade. And one of my uh, teachers had actually, I was actually on the speech and debate team uh, in, in high school. And this is when I was in the 10th grade, but my, my debate coach had given me um, a, a speech uh, that was delivered in 1851 uh, by Sojourner Truth uh, at a women's rights convention in Akron, Ohio. And if you'll, if you'll uh, give me a moment, I'd like to share what I heard um, when I uh, engaged with this uh, important uh, speech. And so if you can close your eyes for just a second and imagine you are in Akron, Ohio in 1851 and an African-American woman uh, in her late 50s mounts this stage. Now, now mind you, this is likely the first time that um, an African-American woman, if you will, has addressed a large audience of largely white um, men and women. And I wanna share with you what Sojourner Truth said on that day. She said, that man over there said that a woman uh, needs to be helped in the carriages and lifted over ditches and had the best place everywhere you see. Nobody uh, ever helped me in the carriages or over mud puddles or gives me a best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arm, you see. Eyes are plowed and planted and gathered into barns. And you know what? No man could head me. And ain't I 
a woman. I've born 13 children and seen most all born into slavery. But when I cried out a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? That man in black there said that a woman can't have as much rights as a man because Christ wasn't a woman. Well, where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with them. If the first woman uh, God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all along, Together, women ought to be able to turn it right side up again. And the legend has it that at that moment, Sojourner Truth walked off the stage, perhaps changing the conscience of her audience. Well, I can assure you in reading uh, that powerful speech, it was my first time uh, really, again, being introduced to the nuanced history and complex experiences of African-Americans, particularly African-American women. That that narrative and that experience had just entered my vocabulary uh, and, and my understanding and my conscience in the 10th grade really fueled uh, my imagination and it fueled my interest in seeing how indeed the history of African and African Americans uh, could be part and parcel of the stories that we told within the context of our classrooms and eventually uh, in the context of our cultural uh, institutions. And in many ways that was the germ uh, for me and really the inspiration for me wanting to um, become a, a scholar in the field of African American history and culture, um, but most importantly, uh, to create a platform where I could help tell the stories of those individual men, women, and children um, of African descent who have been alighted uh, from the, uh, the narrative for far too long. That brings me uh, to my current work at the International African American um, Museum. I want to begin first, um, I think it's important for me to situate uh, my discussion within the context of the mission of the International African American Museum. Our goal and our mission is to honor the untold stories of the African American journey at one of our country's most sacred sites. <sighs> What an amazing and important responsibility um, that, that, that that is, right? Um, to, to really honor those untold stories, uh, to uh, ensure um, that we are able uh, to introduce the larger um, public, local, regional, national, and international um, to this important story and journey and to this incredibly important site. I start here because in many ways, our mission signifies the centrality of race, place, and identity as we envisioned uh, this institution and certainly as Mayor Riley, who really was the visionary uh, for um, you know, introducing this kind of cultural institution to Charleston long, long before I, jo I joined uh, the team two years ago, Mayor Riley, um, had begun the important work of stewarding this project um, over 20 years ago. Uh, but again, again, this idea of race, place, and identity is critical to this mission. Um, it's critical uh, in many ways because it uh, encourages and acknowledges the historical gravitas um, of the hollow grounds on which the museum will be located, which is at Gaston's Wharf. Um, and for many uh, who are familiar and or unfamiliar with historic Gatson's Wharf, it's really understood as ground zero um, and one of the most important uh, sites uh, for, uh, for the importation, um, the incoming uh, trafficking of African-Americans through 
uh, African people, excuse me, through the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and so I wanted to be sure that you saw this uh, particular image, uh, which is sort of a bird's eye view of the IM site, um, where it is indeed located at Gaston's Wharf at the Charleston Harbor. The other thing that's really important to our mission, um, as indicated uh, in our mission statement, is that it is deeply important that we chart the rich and complex history and culture of African Americans and their place within the wider, uh, wider communities um, to which they belong uh, within the larger African diaspora. Hence my title's use of African roots and African routes. Uh, in, in many ways, um, what you'll see here in this global sites of memory um, elevation um, or graphic uh, is the ways in which the museum uh, is part of a larger community of other international and global uh, institutions that seek to tell the story uh, of not only the history of enslavement, uh, but certainly the history of the peopling of the Atlantic world and the larger African diaspora. And so this globe, in my opinion, uh, does a really excellent job of illustrating the network of cultural institutions that serve as sites of conscience and that really help uh, and, and help chart uh, this global African diasporic story. I also think that it's important uh, to acknowledge uh, that I am not uh, the, um, uh, I did not create this phraseology of roots and routes. Um, frankly, I am drawing on the scholarship of black scholars uh, such as Paul Gilroy and Stuart Hall, who both leveraged the concepts of roots and routes um, to interrogate black identity and cultural production uh, within the larger Atlantic world. And so I wanted to be sure that I uh, acknowledged that part uh, before I continued uh, my presentation. I think it's really important to acknowledge uh, the uh, perspective uh, and the intellectual prowess of scholars uh, that have helped shape our vocabulary and the discourse around uh, race, identity, uh, place, cultural production within the wider African diasporic world. So uh, as I uh, move through uh, the remainder of my presentation, I have two broad uh, objectives um, here. I largely would like to provide an overview of the International African American Museum's interpretive uh, and design framework and a, a walkthrough of select exhibitions. Uh, in my view, uh, the museum as a, in some, in some ways as the new kid on the block, uh, so many aren't familiar uh, with, uh, with the uh, sort of the interpretive um, and design um, framework that we're utilizing and really the, the co concepts that shape um, the museum uh, and that will be an important part of the visitor uh, experience. And so I will uh, proceed uh, to, to, to make good on those objectives. So to begin, I imagine, and I, I, I'd like to ensure um, that the institution that we we're building is not a, a place where there is a poverty of imagination, right? Um, we wanna create a place where people will actually pilgrimage to, uh, to interrogate again, that global narrative for which African American, uh, African American, uh, African American, excuse me, in Charleston and South Carolina, and again, their place within the larger global community to which they belong. Uh, in many ways, the International African American Museum will do this in a multitude of ways, um, and I'm just sort of identifying uh, two broad lanes for which uh, the museum uh, will hope to ensure that there's not that poverty of imagination and that we are indeed a site of conscience uh, where visitors um, can not only um, learn more about African and African American history and culture, um, but they walk away activated uh, to do the important work um, of, of continuing uh, to tell that story uh, and, and to uh, engage in the important work of equity uh, and inclusion. Um, and so from an institutional perspective, the International African American Museum, it's a complex, if you will, includes a memorial, um, the museum proper, 
and a research complex. Uh, to be specific, the memorial is uh, actually part of the exterior experience. It is an African ancestral memorial garden. Um, we have a fantastic uh, landscape architect, noted, uh, renowned uh, Walter Hood, who is designing a real monument um, to the uh, to the profundity of African uh, history, African and African American history and culture, and really, it is an homage uh, to those ancestors um, who uh, passed away during the the tragic transatlantic uh, slave trade. Um, I, you know, when I was looking for elevations, um, there were no elevations that I had at my disposal at the moment that would quite do. Um, the memorial justice, but trust me, uh, this is simply a teaser description um, of this very compelling landscape uh, that will be an important way to connect uh, the museum, its story uh, of African Americans in Charleston and in South Carolina to the wider diasporic community. Uh, most importantly, that part of the museum experience will largely be free and open to the general public. And so even if you come to the museum and decide not to um, uh, pay admissions to come inside to visit our uh, actual exhibitions, you still have an opportunity to bask um, in um, the botanical experience and the cultural experience that will be the ancestral gardens. The museum, of course, which I'll talk a bit more about uh, in just a second, and then in terms of a research complex, the museum will include a Center for Family History, which will be a premier site uh, for uh, African-American ancestral genealogy. Um, and I will talk just a bit more about that uh, at the close of my presentation. I'd like to take you uh, to our Center for Family History website um, to show you um, the clear resources um, that are already made available, um, even as the museum has not opened its doors yet. Um, it really is a demonstration of the ways in which the museum, uh, though not open, is a museum without walls. Uh, and so over the next two years, we hope to develop a suite of pro public programs and to begin to make our research resources readily available. Um, and part of that is through our Center for Family History. The other uh, important piece here in terms of thinking about the International African American Museum is really thinking about the intervention it makes in terms of not just telling a local and regional story, but telling a national and an international one. Um, and so that, uh, that sort of approach to telling that story is deeply important uh, to the mission and ethos. And I'll explain that a bit more as we move through the presentation. But I just wanted to paint a picture for you um, of the ways in which the International African American Museum will be a compelling uh, site, uh, a compelling uh, site of conscience and a place of pilgrimage. I truly believe that people will trek from across the world uh, to visit our museum, uh, to really commune uh, with the heritage, culture and history um, that shapes this incredible uh, story. So to begin, I thought I would provide a much more um, sort of uh, technical uh, overview um, of, of the museum. Um, and this is a, uh, a blueprint uh, of our museum or our museum floor plan where you can kind of see um, the uh, nearly 40,000 square feet um, of exhibition uh, and research and our research complex with the Center for Family History. And so I'd just like to briefly um, provide a quick walkthrough um, of, um, of our floor plan so that you can have a broad sense um, of the museum. And then I'll provide a bit more details about select galleries. Um, if you look to your left, um, and I'm sort of putting my, cursory, my cursor over here, uh, excuse me, go back one slide, you'll see our Center for Family History, uh, which uh, again, uh, will be a, a major resource for the exploration of African-American uh, genealogy. Um, there will uh, be uh, workshops. Um, there are research um, spaces. So folks can actually come in 
um, and, um, and interrogate their own histories, their personal histories, um, and um, really uh, be provided with first-rate guidance from uh, our genealogists um, and research assistants. I'm so, so excited to tell you a bit more about the Center for Family History and take you to the website at the end here. You'll also note that we have um, nearly, um, and I'll use my cursor here, um, a changing exhibition gallery, uh, which will be where we're able to make important interventions in our interpretive experience um, through traveling exhibitions. Um, and so we have a large space devoted to that. Um, you'll also see here the American Journeys uh, Gallery, which in many ways is a survey um, of American history and culture, largely um, tracing um, American history from the launch of the Atlantic world uh, in the 1400s, all the way to um, contemporary social justice movements, including the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I'll, again, I'll show you a graphic elevation to provide much more of a visual um, vocabulary for what that gallery looks like. And then if you move across uh, the, the uh, blueprint here, you'll see our orientation theater. Uh, and I'll show an image of that in just a second. You'll see our transatlantic galleries, um, our Gullah Geechee Gallery, South Carolina Connections, uh, studio time, uh, which will be a, a space for workshops and for um, interfacing with students and teachers. Uh, we have African Roots, Atlantic Worlds, Carolina Gold, and then we have a Middle Passage uh, Rail, which is technically part of our Atlantic Worlds gallery. Um, I'm, I'm moving quite fast over that because I will provide um, a bit more context uh, for those particular galleries um, as we move through the presentation. The museum relies on a, a constellation of interpretive and design frameworks. And I think it's really important to point to uh, the nearly, um, here we have documented roughly 10, 10 different strategies that we're employing um, to make for a innovative and engaging uh, visitor experience that will connect the stories that we tell uh, to a diverse um, audience. Um, and so we have um, a number of experiences uh, that includes ambient audio. Uh, we obviously have narrative um, and presentation, environmental, um, so immersive experiences. And so I'll provide an example of that. Uh, we have uh, flexible uh, module spaces planned. We have uh, interpretive frameworks that are much more didactic, meant to, to bring the visitor in, um, to read the details, if you will. Um, you'll also note uh, that we have spaces for workshops, spaces for interaction, oops, uh, spaces for much more dynamic and social uh, interface among visitors, dialogue, we have a story booth. And then of course, uh, we will rely a great deal um, on uh, mobile apps, um, ways to connect uh, with the many audiences that uh, now connect with uh, interpretive material through their mobile um, phones. And that's becoming uh, incredibly important too, as we're having to sort of rethink how visitors interface um, with, for instance, our um, touch screens uh, in, uh, the, in this moment of COVID-19. And so we're really having to think innovatively as we're planning our interpretive uh, and design um, uh, work ahead. And so again, I wanted to provide what, again, one of the things that I began my presentation with is that um, the museum really seeks um, to tell a local, regional, national, uh, and international um, story. And an example of our, 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 our effort to, to illustrate uh, the, again, the profundity, the breadth um, of uh, African-American history and culture in South Carolina is in our South Carolina Connections uh, gallery. In this particular gallery, um, there is a focus um, on history makers, on major events uh, and individuals um, that have truly shaped 
uh, the uh, the progress, uh, but also the the challenges and opportunities that have been met by uh, African Americans in the region. Um, we center on social justice. Uh, we look at educators and uh, political um, uh, politicians and activists and a whole host of individuals um, who have contributed to the rich history that shapes the region. Um, one thing to note um, that we are incredibly excited about is this sort of dialectical experience that will be um, the, the experience that uh, visitors will have as they interface uh, with our content on the walls, as well as a interactive uh, table. Um, the walls are meant to be much more people centric and focused on the individuals really humanizing events. Um, but the table is meant to be much more about placemaking. Um, we are we have uh, received the generous in kind um, support uh, from Google uh, to re to really develop a table, an inter interactive table that will uh, help uh, tell the stories um, of South Carolinians through the historic sites that shape that narrative. Um, and so we are using a cartographic um, approach and place making approach here um, to help connect our visitors. Um, again, to um, uh, African American history from a, a much more place and event centric um, perspective. Uh, one of the things that's really important to us is to not just focus on, for instance, Charleston and the Low Country, but to really tie to all of the state. Um, and so we're working really diligently um, to uh, create a filter uh, to guide the content that will be delivered through this table. We're literally in the throes of not only developing um, you know, the content for this table, but also really thinking about the technological capacity. We're thinking about things like social distancing and how to, how to actually create an experience where multiple users can interface with the table in a safe way. Um, and of course, how do we ensure uh, that our visitors are able to uh, connect uh, across the region? Um, and so we're really developing that technology um, and that data set um, as we speak. Some of the filters um, that we're thinking of or, or approaches to delivering content is thinking about, for instance, um, African-American cemeteries, African-American churches, um, places where um, major events, um, historic events have taken place. Um, obviously, a story like Brown v. Board of Education has, um, uh, has uh, purchased in so many parts of the state, but perhaps elevating the story um, of Clarendon County um, and uh, the efforts of individuals uh, like Reverend uh, Delane, uh, who really was an important steward um, of uh, the uh, of of the uh, Brown, um, excuse me, of the mobilization um, that led to the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Uh, so often, when we think about Brown um, as a as a legal decision, as a landmark decision, um, some people really forget how important South Carolina and South Carolinians was to this landmark. Um, uh, decision. Um, and so we're able to illuminate that story both on our walls, but also really tying it to the communities and places that help to uh, drive that story. And so this just gives you a sense again of a, a visual um, articulation of, of that visitor experience. And to be clear, these elevations um, are, um, are, are perhaps a smidge dated uh, because we continue to evolve the design. Um, and so again, this is just to give you a visual sense um, of the experience uh, that, uh, that we'll have at, at the International African American Museum. Again, this is a example of our, 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 our efforts to really tell the, the local and regional story. In terms of the national, we will have a massive um, exhibition called American Journeys. Um, and this gallery, again, really traces African American history from the 1400s to the present. Uh, in this graphic elevation, what you see um, is really a focus on one of roughly 12 exhibitions that make up this large gallery. Um, this is actually our Emancipation to Reconstruction section um, that really, uh, again, looks at this critical moment in African American history and culture. Uh, what's important about the American Journeys Gallery, again, in many ways, it's a survey 
um, of American history uh, using an African American lens, but we're really intentional about um, placing Charleston within the national story. And so again, illuminating local uh, and regional events uh, that shape the broader national narrative. Um, but we've also um, ensured that there are layers um, in, this, in this experience um, that include the ways in which Charleston um, and the region uh, interfaced uh, internationally. And so we're really excited uh, again, to be able to, to present uh, this inherently American story um, as both a local narrative but as a international one. Uh, deeply important to the delivery of content in this section is the constellation um, of uh, elements of the visitor experience. And so here you see um, we'll have objects um, and uh, uh, artifacts on display We'll also have uh, media programs. Um, we have slated uh, uh, a media as artifact installation. Um, we also uh, will uh, have a number of ways to connect to primary source materials um, and, and really to journey um, almost this Herculean narrative um, to really journey uh, through that information in a, a very uh, innovative way. And so we're just excited uh, to be able to tell this part of the story. And I apologize about the pixelization of this image, uh, but again, as we think about uh, the international components uh, of the stories that we'll tell uh, at the International African American Museum, um, one of our opening, uh, our sort of starter galleries, if you will, is the Transatlantic Gallery. And in many ways, our hope here is to equip visitors um, with a vocabulary, uh, with a visual literacy um, of broad concepts that shape the visitor experience. And that includes large concepts like it, the African diaspora, transatlantic trade, creolization, uh, concepts that are deeply important to understanding the peopling of the Atlantic world, but most importantly, that will help our visitors begin to um, become um, conversant, if you will, in concepts that are deeply important uh, to the uh, African uh, and African-American experience. This is meant to be an immersive experience, and I uh, I feel awful that this image doesn't quite capture it, uh, but there are multiple screens along both sides uh, of this gallery. Um, we uh, have slated a, a water installation so that um, visitors actually feel like they're in the Atlantic, um, that they begin to again, see those, that vocabulary, begin to see the peopling and begin to envision um, our past as we journey towards the present uh, and the future. So um, this, is uh, meant to be much more immersive rather than didactic, um, and it's much more of a, vi a visual experience, if you will. In Atlantic Worlds, really, uh, in some ways, this gallery builds on um, the introductory uh, materials that are presented in the transatlantic galleries. Uh, it is really meant, uh, again, to place um, uh, the Atlantic worlds um, and the, the historic uh, critical moments um, and critical personalities that shaped uh, the uh, interaction between Africa, Europe, uh, South America, North America, and the Caribbean in particular. Um, and again, this gallery is really meant to not only tell that international uh, narrative, but if you look out, you'll see the vista of the Charleston Harbor. Um, literally surrounded by the Atlantic. Um, there's a major media installation here. Um, we're still working on the actual narrative that we will tell uh, in, in this particular part of our media experience. Um, but we are looking um, toward uh, telling the story of other sacred sites. Um, so in some ways we will uh, tell the story of, for instance, Gatson's Wharf, as it also uh, is part of that, again, that international uh, narrative of other ports in places like Ghana um, and in not France uh, that had major ports tied to the transatlantic trade. Another particularly important part of our Atlantic Worlds Gallery um, is a emphasis on the Middle Passage um, and its importance 
important uh, role um, really in peopling um, the transatlantic trade and really the traumatic experiences um, of um, African men, women, and children who journeyed uh, to the Americas and uh, who were dispersed throughout the Atlantic world um, to, uh, as part of the transatlantic trade. Um, and so we, we really worked to, to tell that story in a very sensitive um, and thoughtful way. Um, in many ways, I see uh, this particular gallery as the soul um, of, uh, of the museum, as the place where people can come to wonder, uh, to really think about the past, um, but to also begin to really see um, and visualize how Charleston is very much part of uh, the Atlantic world and the African diasporic experience. And then we also, uh, I thought it would be important for me to mention, uh, not only is the title of my presentation inspired uh, by folks like Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy, um, but we have provisionally entitled exhibitions um, that um, are called African Roots and African Routes. Uh, our goal here is to really uh, tell uh, the broader narrative um, centering on West and West Central Africa, thinking about those empires, thinking about geography, uh, thinking about the diversity of ways uh, African people um, really developed uh, their own uh, governments, their own communities uh, prior to contact. Um, and then we journey to uh, the, the wider um, African diaspora. And that's where African roots is really meant to um, explore the ways in which um, African people created communities uh, throughout the world um, and throughout the Atlantic. Um, we explore intellectual connections. We look at spirituality. Um, we look at the cultural profundity of the people that shape the larger Atlantic world. Um, there are a constellation of interactives that help shape this experience as well. Um, and I, 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 I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I did want to make sure that as we're thinking about race, place, and identity, um, a critical part um, of the International African American Museum uh, will be our Center for Family History. I just wanted to take you uh, to uh, that uh, website uh, real quickly um, as an introduction, and I want to encourage you to visit that website again. Um, having a little bit of a technical issue getting to Can you see my screen? Brenda, we can see your screen, but it, it's the uh, the kind of desktop PowerPoint version. I don't see anything regarding the, the, the center. Okay, let me, so sorry, let's try that again. I'm gonna stop share for just a second oh. and start that. <laughs> it now? I apologize for that. Can you see it now? Yeah, we've just got the kind of Hollywood squares. Oh, there you go. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and so I just wanted to take you to our Center for Family History. Um, again, as we're thinking about race, place, and identity, I think this is going to be uh, the heartbeat um, of, uh, th that is where race, place, and identity really intersects. Um, you'll see, you'll note that we already have digital archives readily available. Um, we're really hopeful uh, that we'll be able to introduce um, all kinds of um, visitors, um, our large audience segments, uh, to the utility of genealogy. Um, and so our website currently uh, includes um, a number of primary source documentation uh, to begin that work, marriage records, obituaries and funeral programs. Um, we have an ancestor gallery. Um, we also uh, have a number of other uh, learning resources. Um, so if you're interested 
um, and beginning to uh, launch into genealogical research, uh, you can begin that work now long before the museum opens. Again, I really just wanted to bring you to this website to point you to this resource that is already available um, as we are continuing to do the important work of building this institution. Uh, we have roughly a year and a half uh, left to go. And so there's much work to do. Uh, we're nose to the grindstone as it were. Um, and just looking forward to being able to bring this incredibly important institution to Charleston, to South Carolina, uh, to the nation and to the global community to which we belong. I'm going to stop there. I know that uh, we have a, a eager audience who is ready to ask uh, great questions and I am so looking forward to participating in the Q&A. Thank you. Great, well, Brenda, thank you. You uh, obviously have a long year and a half ahead of you uh, and do take comfort in the fact that we are all behind you with all of the important work that you have prior to the launch of the museum. Um, we definitely look forward to the opening and learning from all of your work and all that the International African American Museum has to offer. Um, we're going to turn things now to the question and answer period, but I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight what I thought of as a theme that has percolated throughout um, our conversations yesterday and today, and that being collaboration. Um, I'm a deep believer in partnership and collaboration. And I think all of our presenters here over the last two days would follow uh, my lead with that. Um, it, it, truth be told that where we are as a society, where we are as museum professionals, we would not be as successful as we are without collaboration. And that is not only between curator, curatorial staff, but the larger public as a whole. And so I thank everybody who is on the conference tonight and last night for your support, for your conversation, your dialogue, and everything that you do to see that the most authentic and accurate uh, interpretation of our shared American past comes forward. So thanks to everybody. Uh, as far as the question and answer period, we have Tiffany and Brenda and Lauren are all eagerly awaiting uh, questions and Carrie there at the Decorative Arts Trust um, you may be able to help me with this in some regard, um, but as far as questions that our presenters can respond to, let's work our way backwards. Um, Brenda, a question particularly for you, will the IAAM, the Charleston Historical Society, the Adelston Library, the Avery Research Center, uh, this comes down to collaboration as you can see, um, and the Department of Archives and History in Columbia, combine and share their records with each other. Brenda, do you wanna to speak to collaboration? This may be more about genealogy than the wider history, but how are our shared um, organizations coming together to present this picture for our visitors and our supporters? I think that's a, a, an excellent question. Um, I know that the International African American Museum is deeply invested um, in collaborating with other cultural institutions that are committed to preserving um, the, the histories um, and culture of African Americans writ large. Um, and so I look forward to um, hoping to drive some of those strategic uh, partnerships. Um, what I will say is I currently serve um, on the South Carolina African American a heritage commission. Um, and uh, I can tell you that there is uh, incredible mobilization across the state uh, to collaborate and share resources um, um, across those educational and cultural institutions. Um, I say that to say um, that there's already so much underway um, in terms of collaboration among those uh, who have a vested interest uh, in preserving African-American history and culture. Uh, and so uh, the museum certainly hopes to play a role in that as we continue to uh, do the important work of building our institution. Um, and I, I just wanna underscore the, the already important work that is happening through the South Carolina African-American Commission, which is deeply connected to um, the archives in Columbia. And so there's, again, a great deal of collaboration already happening. Uh, what I will also say is, you, you know, museums are not um, cabinets of curiosity. 
<laughs> you know, and, and they've um, quickly become places that really rely on um, collaboration. Um, and so we've already begun collaborations, for instance, um, with the uh, Charleston uh, Public Library um, to, uh, we, we've already, um, you know, begun the important work of um, building a relationships, for instance, with the Avery Resource Research Center. Uh, for instance, um, more recently, I did a master class um, sponsored by the Smithsonian's um, uh, Office of uh, Strategic Partnerships uh, that was actually held at the Avery uh, Research Center. Um, we're also, um, again, um, using the uh, National Summit for Slavery's uh, rubric on descendant communities, which has been an, an important uh, conduit through which those collaborations can indeed uh, take place, not only between those institutions, but in particular uh, between uh, institutions um, and the communities that we serve. So those descendant communities um, are deeply important to, to that collaboration. All right, fabulous. Well, another uh, question in, in uh, may need to get back to, let's see, this came from, from Angela Martin. Um, is there anything being done by the Preservation Society to preserve the African-American cemeteries outside the north end of downtown Charleston? There's a group of graveyards there that date back to probably the, the late 18th, early 19th century. And you're correct in acknowledging that um, Angela, I don't know if I or any of our panelists, but anybody raise your hands if you can answer that. Having said that, um, Christopher King, who is the director of the Preservation Society, he is a board member of the Drayton Hall Preservation Trust. Uh, and Angela, if you want to follow up with me, we can carry this conversation forward with Christopher. Uh, another question, this goes uh, back to uh, Tiffany. Um, this is coming from Elon at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, Elon writes, hi, Tiffany, your story about the insulting comments from the so-called architectural historian were so important to share. Were you able to react and respond in the moment? And how did other tour participants react to your comments? Sure. So I was actually at that site as part of a um, summer archaeological field uh, dig. And so what ended up happening was I was there alongside my classmates and this, we'd all read the book. And so this particular gentleman um, started at the front of the house with that comment and it's not very big. So by the time we circled back around and he had, um, and he'd asked for any questions, he had an entire class of graduate students pounce on him <laughs> about what he had missed in that story. Um, um, and, and, you know, the importance of using that book and, and documenting and, you know, and acknowledging those stories. And he came up with some sort of excuse about, well, John McCline was just a little boy. And I was like, well, don't you remember being a little boy? Um, so um, I believe he spent the rest of the summer scowling at me, but uh, it was worth it. So. Good work. Good work. Um, Lauren, there have been uh, several questions related to your work, most of which um, regards how to get a copy of your work. And let's see if I can dial this in. Um, is there a link to Lauren's paper on these finds in the upstairs of the Russell House and throughout the Russell House? You have a lead on providing a public resource to your investigations there in the Russell House kitchen. Um, sure, I'm happy to share uh, the paper that I have. I don't; it's not published anywhere. Um, but actually, a really good place to read more in detail is Instagram, which I know <laughs> sounds crazy, but I've documented this from the beginning on Instagram. So. If you hit the hashtag Russell House Kitchen House, you can read back about all the individual artifacts going back to 2017. Um, and there's also a 45 minute tour on the Historic Charleston Foundation Facebook and Instagram where I hold my phone and talk and walk all through the space and talk about artifacts and um, it's pretty exhaustive. So if you wanna look that up as well, um, you're more than welcome, but uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, via email and I, I can share a copy of this as well. Fabulous. Um, 
One other uh, uh, kind of reoccurring theme on the uh, Q&A board, if you will, and this may be Carrie there at the Decorative Arts Trust. I know we're recording this. Is this conversation and last night's conversation going to become available to those that have registered? I believe the answer is yes. Yeah. Yes, she answers yes. So if um, if you all will stay tuned to your inboxes, there will be links to download and view and review um, the conversations that have taken place over the last two days. Um, let's see, recording. How do I contact Christopher? Angela, if, if you wanna reach out to me directly, I can put you in contact with Christopher. Um, this goes for anybody on the call, my email address is C Hudgens, all one word, C H U D G I N S at DraytonHall.org. And I'd be happy to put you in contact with any of our participants tonight or individuals like Christopher King over at the Preservation Society. Um, and Lauren, the notes in the chat, her email, Lauren J Northup at gmail.com. That's Lauren, L A U R E N J. N O R T H U P at gmail.com. And everybody will receive a link to that, to these recordings about a week after they have occurred. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Um, Sarah Stroud Clark of Drayton Hall does note there's a group that is working on several cemeteries further up the Charleston Peninsula. Happy to share if you want to send her an email. Um, Again, hate to be reading emails, but this is all important communication material. Sarah's email address is S-S-T-R-O-U-D-C-L-A-R-K-E at DraytonHall.org. Um, so Drayton Hall, just as the Decorative Arts Trust, we're a resource for all of you. Please feel free to reach out at any point in time. All right. Um, well, panel, um, I don't know if there are further questions or answers that anybody have. Anybody want to chime in? But it is seven o'clock, and this has been an action packed two hours of very important work that you've all taken part in. And I applaud you all for bringing this to the public's attention and enriching our society as a whole. So I thank you all. Thank everybody on the Zoom session tonight for your continued engagement and support. We couldn't do it without you. And stay tuned. Uh, this is the second installment of a partnership that Drayton Hall Preservation Trust has had with the Decorative Arts Trust. And we hope that we can move forward and have continued engagement in the future with important topics like those that we've discussed tonight. So I thank you all, and I look forward to seeing you all in the near future. Thank you, everybody.